In this screencast, we will review blunt splenic injury as part three in our series on blunt abdominal trauma. At the end of this screencast, you should be able to describe the relevance of the splenic grading system, differentiate pseudoaneurysm from active extravasation, and recommend next steps in management based on key engine features. The key decision is non-operative management versus angiography or surgery. Let's look at the AAST splenic organ injury scale, which was revised in 2018. It has grades one through five, and a grade one injury can either be related to a hematoma, laceration, or capsular tear. The hematoma should be less than 10% of the surface area of the spleen, and the laceration should be less than one centimeter in depth. The capsular tear should be a minimal injury to the surface of the spleen. A grade two injury, again, can be a hematoma, and in this case, the hematoma should occupy less than 50% of the surface area. You can have an interparenchymal hematoma, similar to what we described in the liver, but in this case, the hematoma must be less than five centimeters, where in the liver, it's less than 10 centimeters to qualify as a grade two laceration. Similar to the liver grading scale, a laceration of the spleen that's less than three centimeters in depth will be classified as grade two. Grade three injuries are going to be, again, similar to that liver grading scale. In this case, greater than 50% of the surface area of the spleen. A hematoma that is greater than five centimeters in diameter, but shows no evidence of active extravasation or pseudoaneurysm. Or a laceration greater than three centimeters in depth. A grade four splenic injury is a severe injury that often requires some form of intervention. In this case, any vascular injury or active bleeding that is contained within the spleen is going to be considered a grade four injury. So that could be a pseudoaneurysm, a focus of active extravasation, or an arteriovenous fistula, which is very difficult to differentiate from a pseudoaneurysm on CT. You could also have a large laceration that causes devascularization of a portion of the spleen or central hilar vessel or segmental vessel involvement. These grade four injuries are often going to require some form of intervention, preferably angiography, but if a patient is not hemodynamically stable after aggressive resuscitation, operative management may be required. Grade five injury is the most severe form of injury. In this case, any form of bleeding from a vascular injury that extends into the peritoneal cavity, so intraperitoneal hemorrhage, is going to be considered a grade five injury. It will often require angiography, or surgery, depending on the stability of the patient. Another type of grade five injury is a shattered spleen in which there is devascularization and multiple regions of laceration that extend throughout the spleen. Again, this can oftentimes be treated with angiography if the patient is hemodynamically stable, but if after resuscitation, the patient cannot maintain stability, surgery may be required. Now let's look at a few cases of splenic injury. Here we have a small two centimeter laceration of the spleen. On arterial phase, we can see associated with that laceration, a small focus of dense contrast in the region of that laceration that is similar in density to the aorta. On the portal venous phase, we can see that region of contrast ex has expanded or changed its size and shape. That is our first indication that this could be a region of active extravasation. It also, in this case, is closely mimicking the aorta, but will often maintain more density than the aorta. On the delayed phase, we can see that that region continues to enlarge and maintain some foci that are more dense than the aorta, and this is consistent with active extravasation from a small laceration. So even though the laceration was two centimeters, the active extravasation into the peritoneal cavity results in a grade five injury. This particular injury was treated with embolization as the patient was stable after resuscitation. Here we have another example of a splenic injury. This was a woman who's riding a motorcycle. And in this case, we see a laceration here through the spleen. We see a splenic hematoma, but in addition, we have this focus of high density in the spleen. This is consistent with a vascular injury. And we now would like to further classify that vascular injury as either a pseudoaneurysm or active extravasation. 
In this case, on the portal venous phase, we can see that the vascular injury closely parallels the aorta in density. On the delayed phase, there is also density very similar to the aorta, albeit maybe slightly more dense. Again, on the portal venous phase, we see this well-defined area. Okay? And on the delayed phase, notice that we don't see this area change shape. We also do not see any pooling in the perisplenic space of the perineal cavity. In this instance, we can classify this as a pseudoaneurysm of the spleen. It is contained within the splenic tissue. It does not show any intraperitoneal bleed, and therefore it is a grade four splenic injury. This grade four splenic injury did require operative management. That is because the patient was hemodynamically unstable. So even though we did not see any active extravasation in the peritoneal cavity, the inability to maintain the patient's blood pressure despite aggressive resuscitation resulted in an emergent laparotomy and a splenectomy. Ideally, if this patient could have been hemodynamically stable after resuscitation, this pseudoaneurysm could have been treated with embolization. So we have two different instances, one a grade five injury treated with embolization because the patient was stable, another instance of a grade four injury that was treated with surgery because of patient instability. Another case, we have an unrestrained driver and a motor vehicle collision. On the arterial phase, we see multiple foci of high density along the inferior pole of the spleen. We also see quite a bit of fluid within the peritoneal space around the spleen. On the portal venous phase, those areas of density become more prominent, possibly due to slight enlargement of those areas. On the delayed, we see those regions become diluted and are not quite as prominent, but are more amorphous than they were on these prior phases. This was felt to represent active extravasation, and we may even see a little bit of pooling in the perisplenic space. This person was taken to angiography. On the angiography, they did detect some active extravasation from the lower pole of the spleen, and this was treated with coil embolization. Here we have another case of splenic injury, in this case, a 26-year-old who fell onto a toolbox in his pickup truck bed. Unlike the other cases, we had a non-contrast image in this patient that showed a large hematoma with some mixed density along the spleen. This covers more than 50% of the splenic surface and is therefore at least a grade three injury. On the portal venous phase, we see this region of linear, sort of ill-defined hyperdensity consistent with contrast along the splenic capsule. We also can see that the hematoma appears to have gotten larger. And on the delayed phase, we again see that linear density along the capsule, but the, an area that has actually increased in size and density on the delay with additional increase in the size of the perisplenic hematoma. Because of the changing in the size and the persistent density of this abnormality, this is more consistent with active extravasation into the peritoneal space. This is a grade five injury of the spleen due to active extravasation into the peritoneal cavity. The patient did go to angiography and no active extravasation was evident despite the CT imaging findings. The patient was prophylactically embolized with gel foam at times with expanding hematomas or appropriate patient positioning. There can be tamponade of active extravasation and that can impact the diagnostic sensitivity of angiography. But to ensure that active extravasation does not restart with patient positioning or movement, or in the future, gel foam embolization can reduce the risk of re-bleeding. In summary, the revised AAST scale really focuses on vascular injury. Grade one, two, and three splenic injuries are almost always managed non-operatively. Grade four injuries are Severe injuries, often with some form of vascular injury, but that vascular injury is contained within the spleen. Grade five injuries are either a shattered spleen, which is completely devascularized, or a spleen that has some vascular injury with bleeding into the peritoneal cavity. Again, management is not dependent on the grade, but is dependent on the patient's hemodynamic status. Patients will go to the operating room for a splenectomy if they cannot be stabilized, but ideally they could go to interventional radiology for embolization. Thank you for your time. I hope you've enjoyed part three of this series on blunt abdominal trauma, and I hope you join us for part four on renal injuries.